I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Thomas X. Hamas, a distinguished research fellow at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at National Defense University. Dr. Hamas retired at the rank of Colonel from the United States Marine Corps after 30 years of service, during which he served at all levels in the operating forces, including the command of an intelligence battalion, an infantry battalion, and the Chemical Biological Incident Response Force. He participated in stabilization operations in Somalia and Iraq as well, training insurgents in various places. Dr. Hamas has a doctorate in modern history from Oxford University and is the author of three books and over 200 articles. He lectures extensively on the future of conflict, strategy, and insurgency in the United States, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. So TX, that is what you go by, sir. Welcome. Right. And before anything, let me thank you so much for your career of service to our nation. Well, I think what people need to understand is that a lot of us join because we enjoy the challenge and the work. And I thoroughly enjoyed my 30 years and felt privileged to have the opportunities. Well, and again, thank you so much for your service. So Today, we are exploring themes from your new Atlanticist article, Autonomous Weapons Are the Moral Choice. When I read the title of that, I said, this is one I have to do. I, I think it's exciting, and it's also a really good counterpoint to a lot of what I have been reading out there about fear, uncertainty, and doubt regarding AI and autonomy. So you do make an interesting case for the addition of autonomous weapons to the U.S. military arsenal. The first sentence of this reads simply, to succeed in the battle space, the United States must field autonomous weapons. So let me start by asking you for an overview of why this is the case and what inspired you to write this article. Well, we've been seeing uh, it's not autonomous weapons joining the American services. We have had them at least since 1979, when we had a captured torpedo that was anchored to the bottom of the ocean in the ice and UK gap. And upon activation, if a Soviet submarine came near, it would, it would automatically activate. No one would have to tell it to hunt. But it was a smart mind in that it listened for uh, noises and magnetic signature, et cetera, that told it was a Soviet submarine. So we've had this for a long time. It's becoming critical now because cheap mass is available with autonomy. Um, what we're seeing in Ukraine is the use of thousands of drones. Um, the Ukrainians uh, may lose as many as 10,000 drones a month. They've ordered 200,000 drones in, Ju in July. They ordered them for delivery by the end of December. I don't know if they'll make that number. But there's also huge progress. Drones you normally think of with a pilot sitting there flying it. More and more drones are becoming autonomous. They take off, they fly to an area, and then they hunt based on onboard sensors. Uh, this was normally more extensive drones like the uh, Israeli Harap or Harpy, and uh, they've come cheaper and cheaper. The Russians just took the uh, Lancet drone they have, which may be 100,000 a piece, and put on LIDAR, light. I mean, it's a light radar type thing. It uses light to get a radar signature type. Uh, this allows the, the drone to hunt autonomously. It launches, it flies to an area, and then it starts to orbit. It's what's called a loitering munition. It simply loiters over the battlefield until it finds something uh, that matches its memory, what it's got in its, uh, in its sensors, and matches the signatures and says, that's the target I've been authorized to attack, and then it attacks the target suicides into the target right at the top of the article you quoted the august 28th speech by deputy secretary of defense kathleen hicks where she unveiled the new replicator initiative which seeks to quote unquote reduce cost reduce american casualties and reduce development and deployment times with what you are calling laws or lethal autonomous weapons what separates a next generation autonomous weapon from something like today's Russian kamikaze drone or even a U.S. cruise missile? Well, the cruise missile flies to a specific point. Uh, there are some versions that do hunt, but we haven't used those uh, widely. Generally, when you think of a cruise missile, it goes to a GPS coordinate. So it's not really autonomous. 
the operator says, this is what you're going to hit, and then launches it. An autonomous weapon is told, this is the type of target you will engage, go find it. Now, the problem is that the people make the mistake of calling those fully autonomous. There are no fully autonomous weapons. Until Skynet is active and runs the entire society and builds the factory and sets the parameters and puts the missiles in place, then you'll have fully autonomous drones. Until that time, they're semi-autonomous. In that a human places them, selects the parameters it's going to search under, determines the time to launch, and then launches them. So it is semi-autonomous in that once it leaves the launcher, it hunts according to the directions it's been given. Well, thank you for mentioning Skynet, because that sets up my next question perfectly. That's I, That could not be better. So one of the biggest challenges with autonomous weapons, I think, right now, seems to be public perception. And movies like The Terminator, which I have discussed several times in the past, uh, ranging from The Terminator to social media activism, like the Slaughterbots video, I believe that was 2017, 2019, around that era, and that made the rounds as a meme. Uh, these things have created substantial public fear about taking humans out of the loop. Now, I have argued that the Terminator is more a retelling of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as a morality tale more than it is a warning. And you have argued in the article that Slaughterbot's video is basically inflammatory more than it is a rational criticism. So what are your thoughts about some of the negative publicity that, again, AI and autonomy have had? Well, I think one of the problems is people misunderstand what an autonomous weapon is. It's not going to go off and think on its own or decide what it's going to do. The limits are hardwired in or in built into the software that you're going to hunt within this geographic area. And then you're going to only look for this kind of target. And uh, this will be, you'll only obviously hunt after a human has set you up and launched you and put those parameters in. So that's not true autonomy. The AI, like Skynet, is the um, general AI, or uh, human-like AI. General AI, there's a great deal of dispute whether we will ever be able to achieve that or not. Some say yes, some say no. Uh, once you create a being more intelligent than you are, then you may have a problem. That is not what autonomous weapons are, nor what the argument should be about. Autonomous weapons are about leveling the playing field for the people we send forward to defend our interests. It's incredibly immoral to send people into a fight knowing their equipment is substandard. If you send someone to fight an enemy that can launch thousands of autonomous drones and you don't have them, you're setting yourself up to lose after you've lost a lot of people. And that's a fundamentally immoral decision. Well, and that's an excellent point. I mean, it, these drones are already being used in Russia, right? I mean, Russia has uh, thousands of Ukraine drones that they're launching. I believe Iran is supplying those, so Iran has them as well. Uh, you know, the Ukrainians have a collection of drones, and these range in size and capabilities and type. Um, from what I understand, some of them are using GPS guidance. Others are guided by wire. They have varying levels of autonomy, but they are still kind of on the basic level of things, right? So this technology is already out there. It's being used by our competitors and our adversaries. Uh, so I think one of the arguments that you made in the article was, if we don't deploy this, we fall behind. It's, it's already being used. We need to at least have parity. Right. Yeah, I mean, there already apparently are autonomous drones in Ukraine. Neither side is admitting that, but when you read some of the accounts of the fights, um, there are a number of ways you have to overcome. The biggest problem you have to overcome is electronic warfare environment. Electronic warfare is the best way, or has been to date, the best way to deal with these drones, because if you can cut the signal, the signal, uh, most of them will be programmed to return to home. Others are not, and they just crash. Um, so they're out there. The, the autonomous drones are out there. What you're looking for in an electronic warfare environment, it needs to be GPS independent, and uh, it needs to be autonomous. And as you begin to look at drones for drone delivery, and again, drone delivery has been promised for years, not a great deal of progress, although it's being used in some places in the world to deliver to isolated areas. 
But if you really want it, it has to be GPS independent if you're going to deliver in urban areas or in mountain canyons, because that can interfere with the satellite signature. So GPS independence is something people are working on. We already have enough GPS independence you can fly to an area. Well, if you fly to an area and then turn on the search, uh, then that takes it to the specific target. And that's the Israeli, uh, the, Har the Harpy was the early version. It was an anti-radiation uh, missile. It flew to a, ge a geographic area, turned on its sensors, and when it picked up the signature of the radar emitting, it flew down that beam and detonated. Those have since been improved with uh, uh, electro-optical, so multispectral imagery. Uh, and there's also maybe synthetic aperture radar. Obviously, Israelis don't talk about this a lot. But synthetic aperture radar allows you to look through clouds, uh, certain types of weather, lets you see things hiding under trees. There's a lot of this stuff that's out there and available now. Yeah, it, again, it seems like there is a gray area. And and that's what makes this so interesting, right? Is it, it's, it's not a clear cut black and white. I mean, these technologies are already out there and... Uh, you know, it's not as clear cut as people might think. I want to get into the element of human deliberation. This is something that you also covered in the article. And I think you made some really important points. Um, you had written that commanders are responsible for the actions taken by their forces and individual operators are responsible for the employment of their weapon. That would really apply to any weapon used in combat, any weapon in warfare. So regardless of the level of autonomy involved, at some point, a human has programmed or activated it, and ultimately, that human and their commanding officers are responsible, right? Well, this is one of the arguments the anti-people make, that it would be impossible to trace it. Do you get the programmer? Was it a fault in the weapon system, et cetera? None of that applies. We've always had the commanders responsible for, for what he does. If he's got a worn barrel or the barrel's inefficient and it still goes off course, He's responsible for that. So I don't think that is that great a leap, at least from my 30 years in Marine Corps, that would be not that great a leap to assign responsibility for the use of the weapon. I think one of the key things on human accountability, and a lot of the protests was started when we were flying the drones and hunting individual terrorists. In that case, you have long periods of time, and the human should be not on the loop, but in the loop. Unless a human gives a positive command, the weapon cannot work because you've got time. If you've got time, then have the human involved, take the time, consult lawyers, consult ethicists, whatever you need to do to make sure it falls within the law of land warfare and ethical norms. When there are thousands of objects in the air, first off, you don't have enough operators to do that. And second, it's happening too fast. You, even if you are trying to do an individual drone, the things are happening too fast for a human to keep up. We recognize that with our defensive systems like the Aegis special mode, where uh, the commander of an Aegis ship can turn it on and say, okay, at this point, it's beyond human control, ship take over. And the ship then prioritizes and engages inbound targets. And people argue, oh, that's inherently a defensive system. That's true. But we also use it for minefields for smart mines. You can't have someone out there monitoring every mine. So a smart sea mine will compare the acoustic signature with a magnetic signature, with a displacement signature, and the software will grind along and very often attack a specific ship type. If you have recent recordings of a specific ship, it can go after that specific ship. And so that is a unattended smart weapon. But again, it's been pre-programmed and put in place, and you're much more likely to get an ethical outcome from that uh, then very often from remember the humans, it doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be better than a human. And having been in the field, when you're 72 hours in with six or seven hours of sleep, you haven't had sufficient food, you're dehydrated, you're cold, your decision-making is a little fuzzy. And so this is where these systems can actually help and help say, okay, like we're talking about the rifle sites that can identify people at a distance. That's uh, AI assisting you in making good decisions still doesn't alter the fact that you're exhausted and in a bad place. There's also the whole dignity of not being killed by a machine. The human dignity argument is one of the strangest I've heard. Whether I'm killed by a machine or by a human who's on a rampage, I don't see much difference in loss of dignity. 
I'm dead uh, or I'm wounded badly, whatever the situation is. But again, we have a lot of cases in history where people just got angry and started killing. And this is why, for instance, the toughest time to surrender is right in the middle of an assault because everybody's blood is up. Their friends have been killed on the way up. They're not certain. They're not certain they can control you. If they do accept your surrender, they got to focus on you and they don't know who's still out there. That's a period where people get shot. Well, and it's I, against the law of warfare, but it's going to happen. I appreciate your mentioning the limits of human endurance. This is something that, for me, I've seen this in the news going back to pilots flying sorties over Kosovo in the 90s. I think that was the first time that it really started to come out. Um, you know, there was many, many articles about uh, pilots living on stimulants and go pills, you know, and trying to take off and land on these carriers repeatedly, obviously in Iraq and, you know, later Afghanistan. Uh, these are all issues where the, the limits of human endurance just can't keep up with a lot of these missions. And so people push themselves. And when they push themselves, they are more likely to make mistakes, right? That I mean, I'm, I'm just using pilots as one example. But yeah, and pilots actually are, uh, while they're exhausted, and uh, there's peak periods of activity, like coming back aboard a carrier, they also have a place to sleep that's temperature controlled. The infantryman may be sleeping in a hole full of water is freezing. And he hasn't had a decent meal because it's whatever MRE he got, if he got one. Uh, in Vietnam, it was very often the case they got one MRE a day and two canteens of water. So they're both dehydrated and hungry. And they've got ringworm and they've got trench foot and maybe malaria and all the other things, but they're out in the jungle and you can't bring them in. So that's the thing people have to keep in mind. It's not a bunch of lawyers sitting around a table having an ethical discussion about whether it's a good kill or not. It's a 19-year-old guy who's exhausted. He's lost friends. He realizes if he fails to take the shot, some of his friends may die, which is often more of a concern to people than whether they're hurt or not. So that's, again, part of this thing. Is it does not be perfect. It needs to be better, as good or better than a human. Yeah. Well, and even in today's world, right, uh, you know, the so the, the MQ-9 Reaper drone, right, those are capable of firing Hellfire missiles. They have been used to target terrorists, but you still have an operator who may be working eight hour shift. They're staring at that screen for eight hours. They can get tired. Right. And, but and so they don't usually make the decision in, in a pattern of life situation like that. They normally alert the commander who will make the decision, who's not on the yeah. screen all the time. And if there's time, they will very frequently consult with a lawyer. Oh, okay. lay out the system, lay out the logic, and then say, okay, does this fall within the law of land warfare? And like I said, when there's time, you want to do all those things because it also takes the burden off the person who has to do the killing. It's very, it's helpful to be reassured that you did the right thing. If you have to do it on your own in a moment, uh, you may wonder, did I do the right thing? Was he trying to surrender? And I just didn't understand. One of the big arguments for autonomous weapons is that without them, the Pentagon risks falling behind in terms of technology. We touched on that a moment ago. Again, in the article you quoted, Hicks is saying the goal is to field attributable autonomous weapons at a scale of multiple thousands in multiple domains within the next 18 to 24 months. So in contrast, Russia, Ukraine, and Iran have already fielded thousands of inexpensive mass-produced drones, many of them loitering in capacity. Uh, those are out there right now. Are we already starting out behind? Well, because we haven't given our people permission to make these. I, I am fully confident we have the software and the sensors to do this. One of the big blocks, of course, everybody's painfully aware of how bad the Pentagon is at procuring things because we have this incredibly complex system that almost everybody can say no, but almost nobody can say yes. So um, that's part of what they're trying to overcome here. I mean, this is why we designed a system post-World War II that's designed to bring big aircraft, big carriers, big tanks into production. And production time goes for a ground vehicle seven to 13 years for an aircraft while well, we're 25 years in the F-35. We haven't really finished testing, although we're building them and fielding them, we haven't finished testing. So that's part of the problem that uh, DepSec Depth is trying to overcome. 
Uh, Secretary Hicks is very smart. She's been in the Pentagon a lot, and she's on top of this, but she's trying to make a system that is just almost specifically designed not to work. She's trying to make it work fast. Well, I, I want to add another reason for that's absolutely compelling to move towards autonomy. This wasn't in your article, but this is something that's kind of been in the headlines. I wanted to kind of build a bridge here for the audience. And that is the U.S. military is having difficulty recruiting, except for one branch that recruits on honor, courage, and commitment. All the rest of them are having trouble. And part of the reason is because fewer Americans meet the physical eligibility requirements for service. So autonomy in both combat and auxiliary roles like transportation, uh, logistics, things along those lines, this could help save labor costs for the DOD. And it could also help fill this gap in staffing levels that is coming out of these recruiting issues, right? Yes, it could. For instance, the Marine Corps uh, you took a helicopter called the KMAX to uh, Afghanistan. It's autonomous. It takes off, it flies to a location and lands. Now, if it's a tricky location, uneven landing zone, et cetera, there'll be a pilot at the other end will take control of it. But when you think about that, that means one pilot can land it and you can put a stream of these things, one every 15 minutes. And the pilot's not actually aboard. He's just at the receiving end, um, maneuvering in position, putting in position to drop its load, and then telling it to go back. And then it flies back on its own. So that would be a huge savings. There's things like that you can do, uh, we hope to be able to do. Um, and so uh, that'll make a significant difference as we get there, just like it will in our, uh, as you go to advanced manufacturing facilities, you begin to see, if you've seen a 3D printing facility, there'll be 100 printers, but only five or six people working there. This actually takes me to your book. So I, I want to get into your book. Uh, it's entitled Deglobalization in International Security. You were just talking about manufacturing. You were talking about 3D printing. All of these technologies really move forward, and they're driving autonomy in general, right? Not just for weapons, but it, for the U.S. military in the future, we could leverage that in so many different ways, it seems like. Well, it's not that they drive autonomy. It's that technologies come together, and it is the fusion of multiple technologies that makes you effective. For instance, Germans created Blitzkrieg not because they had just better tanks. They didn't. They had worse tanks. But they had radio, they had artillery, they had aircraft, and they knew how to blend them together and make that work. And so that's the key, is to take the various technologies and blend them together. This is what AI does for um, drones. Drones with advanced manufacturing, if you can do 3D printing, you can create them in great numbers. And that's another huge problem. One of the things we saw in Ukraine is mass still matters. Lots of stuff is important. But when you look at the systems we have built over the last 30 years or so, at peak production, we'll be able to build 12 F-35s per month. But we sold them to 17 Air Forces, two navies, and a Marine Corps. You may be in a war, a major war, but it's not your turn to get an airplane this month. That's a ridiculous situation to be in. It takes us years to build a ship now. On the other hand, we can build missiles if we go advanced manufacturing quickly. If we put them in standard containers, you can then use any container ship as a missile ship. That's what we've got to start thinking about. You can produce um, the... Uh, Kratos drone, uh, which is the XQ-58A, a uh, firm that used to make target drones, made this, so it's relatively cheap. It's about $2 million a copy as opposed to $115 million for an F-35. So one of these actually outranges the F-35 by twice as far. It launches vertically from either a trailer or literally on this pole that they set up. So um, no airfield. No, nothing you can target to preempt. It lands, it can land in a place different than where it took off from. So you have that, and it's cheap enough you can send it on a one-way mission. So they are setting up a plant in uh, Kansas City, somewhere in the Midwest, Oklahoma maybe, where they'll be able to produce 500 a year. So that's already double the production rate of the F-35, and they're just standing up their first plant. And because it's not such incredibly... Uh, exquisite engineering and exquisite computer work that you have in the F-35, you should probably be able to set up additional plants fairly quickly like we did in World War II. 
or you may be able to convert some of your existing, if they're advanced manufacturing plants, convert some of those to make weapon systems. For instance, we had a professor 3D print a drone in 2014. It took him 24 hours. But the fact of the matter is, that type of printing is 200 times faster now. Amazing. So that's the opportunity here is to create mass with precision. Well, and, and it builds competency also. And I'm going off my questions list a bit, but one of the things that you know, occurs to me is that as the DOD starts to have become more familiar with this type of uh, you know, acquisition, uh, building, deploying these types of systems, it will become second nature to them, right? And and it'll be a technology that will be adopted into the existing framework. They'll know how to do it. They'll know how to add to it. And so as they become more competent with that, we could start to see that in more and more realms. And again, one of the, for me, the, the I think the most exciting part is logistics, because it, it seems like that could be an area where the cost and labor savings just add up so rapidly. And once, nothing is ever perfect, I guess, but once they, they reach a level of comfortability with it, um, that could be something that no one would have any issues with. It would just be something that saves money and helps the military be more cost effective and efficient. So um, we're already using uh, advanced manufacturing 3D printing to replace parts forward. Like rather than carrying 9,000 parts, if you carry the computer code for 9,000 parts and you have a machine that can make them, then you do that. They started with polymer parts. They're starting to move to metal parts. In Europe, uh, GE uh, commissioned their advanced manufacturing team to take the engine out of the Denali. It's a small business prop aircraft, has a turboprop engine. The engine used to have 855 parts. It now has 10. Think of what that does to your supply chain. And also, it, by reducing the number of parts, you reduce the number that you have to take on and off, and very often you damage material when you're replacing things. So we've been uh, Boeing and its Leap engines, or uh, whoever makes the Leap, Pratt Whitney, I'm not sure. They make the Leap engine, big airline engine. There are 18 fuel injectors in that. They used to require 18 parts each and had to be replaced four times over the life of the engine. It's now a single printed part because you can print for function rather than for manufacturing. You can print in the curves that are very, very difficult to manufacture with subtractive manufacturing. And uh, because there's no moving parts and no connections, it actually outlasts the engine itself. Well, TX, I wanna thank you so much for your time today. We have covered a lot. And actually, if you're open to it, I would love to do another one with you, uh, focusing entirely on your book, Deglobalization International Security. I'm going to put a link into the show notes to that, as well as to the article itself. I think you've made a lot of compelling points. And from going through the book, I just want to tell the audience, there is a ton more than just what we've discussed today. You really cover the the entire process involved with basically this fourth industrial revolution and where it's going. Um, I'd like to close by asking what is coming up for you in the next few months and where do you see autonomy going in the next few months as well? Um, I'll continue to do my research on the future of warfare. I'm doing a couple of projects with the Pentagon. Um, autonomy, Warfare tends to come in spikes. It's episodic rather than linear. So you fight a war, whatever one at the end of the last war kind of gets continued to the next one, and then there's a sudden spike as creativity is turned loose. We're seeing that in Ukraine. The advances in autonomy have been tremendous. We've had that knowledge. We know how to do it, but the bureaucracies have been dancing around this question of autonomy for at least a decade now. Well, it's being used because the people who are trying to stay alive are using it. And so we're going to see enormous spike in the application of sensors, in the application of advanced manufacturing. There's some 80 some companies are making drones now within Ukraine, and they're experimenting with different forms of manufacturing. The Australians, I don't know if you've seen the cardboard drone they made. They make okay. a flat pack drone at uh, essentially a K of drones, you flat pack it, you unpack it and you put it together and fly it. So that's the range of things people are experimenting with. And that creates this incredible uh, surge of capability, just like we saw 
at the beginning of just before World War II, when people got serious, war was coming. You watch the performance of aircraft come from bi-wing, almost cloth covered, to mono-wing, all metal airplanes with tremendous capability and range. So we're going to see the same thing in drones and in autonomy. The more you, time you spend in the field, the more the software learns, the more the programmers learn what they've got to put into the software. There's a tremendous feedback loop going on there. And um, I am hoping we're taking advantage of it. I presume we are. I presume we have people forward. Certainly, globally, manufacturers are interested in this because everybody wants to be able to sell this whole generation. If you're a small nation, you can't afford an Air Force, but you can afford thousands of drones, which have a range better than F-35. So lots of potential. Yes. Thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Take care.